The Lord be with you. Now I know if you are like that clock up on the wall, it's 9.30. That means one of two things. Either I have an extra hour to fill, nobody said amen, (laughs) or you all have to, you are charged with keeping your neighbor alert and awake this morning. I hope you'll turn with me to the third chapter of John's Gospel, our text for this morning. Familiar passage, but one we will hear again. John chapter 3, we'll begin in verse 14 and read through verse 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, And he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have everlasting life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. And the light has come into the world And people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. That we would do what you call us to do. Lord, that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The late John Stott, a former Anglican clergyman and a pioneer of the evangelical movement of the last century, wrote in his book, The Message of Romans, God's Good News for the World, he wrote these words. According to the Christian revelation, God's own great love propitiated His own holy wrath through the gift of His own dear Son, who took our place, bore our sin, and died our death. Thus, God gave Himself, God Himself gave Himself to save us from Himself. That's one way to articulate what is known in theology as penal substitution or substitutionary atonement. The idea that God sent Jesus to die in our place because if God didn't, God would have most certainly have to kill us or at least damn us all to an eternity in hell because God cannot stand to be in the presence of our loathsome, sin-soaked selves for even a fraction of a second. God Himself gave himself to save us from himself. Now, aside from that being sort of a theological tongue twister, it probably sounds pretty familiar to most folks who've hung around a church in the last hundred years or so. But can I tell you all something? I mean, since we're all friends here, we're all uh, an hour of sleep deprived, can can I, I feel like I need to be honest with you about something. You see, I'm not sure I buy all that. I'm not sure I buy the whole God sent God's self to save us from himself stuff. It's the last part of that idea that really bothers me. The whole save us from himself bit. God had to save us from God's self? Why? He's God. Does our sin have some sort of power over God that forbids God from just, you know, loving us? Is our sin that much greater than God's love? Is God's wrath like some sort of inevitable, irreversible bomb that once the fuse is lit, it can't be stopped, and so God had to send Jesus to jump on the grenade for us, to take the shrapnel for us, to die, so we wouldn't have to? I have to tell you, such a notion seems to paint a picture of God who is honestly somehow less than omnipotent. A God who is less than all-powerful. 
If this God can be so easily turned aside by little more than our human failures or some sort of conceived contractual obligation, I, I just don't buy it. I can't make the reality of a God who is so clearly identified as love, a God who did in fact enter into human history incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, a God who willingly suffered and died, did it to save us from himself? That sounds like a lack of divine willpower to me. But if God didn't send Jesus to save us from God's self, then from what or whom did God send Jesus to save us? I suppose one answer might be the devil. We like the devil. Satan, Lucifer, the enemy. I mean, that seems to be a popular notion and within our culturally appropriated notions of Christianity. God's the ultimate good guy, right? The one who stands on the main drag of town with the big white hat and the polished six-shooter. The devil is the one at the other end, the black hat, the black gun, right? I think, I think the most direct image of this notion I've seen uh, in recent years was on one of those posts on social media. Do you know what I'm talking about, right? It's one of those that says something like, like if you love Jesus, ignore if you love the devil. Better not ignore it. Right? I once saw one that literally had Jesus, a uh, white Jesus, black beard, white robe, shiny, arm wrestling the devil. Red skin, big black horns, just snarling. They were arm wrestling, and it said, Like if you think Jesus will win, ignore if the devil will. I suppose if it didn't get enough likes, the devil was going to throw down on Jesus like Stallone and over the top. And if you haven't seen that movie, do yourself a favor, go watch it. It's silly. God gave God's self to save us from the devil. I'm not too sure I buy that either. I mean, it seems to me like the more direct way to save us from the devil would be to take him on directly. Maybe really in some sort of arm wrestling match, some cosmic clash that would ultimately decide the fate of the universe and all who abide therein. Actually, now that I say that out loud, it sounds more like a scene from Star Wars, right? God is on one side with a blue lightsaber, the devil's on the other with a red, and God eventually wins. But of course, that's not how things really are. I mean, we've sort of inflated the devil in our own minds. Raising Satan up from the Satan, the accuser we find in the book of Job, to some cosmic deity on a nearly equal but opposite level with God. And that's just not orthodox. We've got it in our heads that the devil is this powerful force outside of ourselves, pulling at us, tempting us, setting a catastrophic course for this world in which we live. And we blame the devil. We blame the devil for almost everything these days. We say, Satan is at work when the politicians we don't like get elected to office. Or we say, Satan is at work when politicians we do like get elected to office and other people criticize them. The devil is somehow responsible for whatever we see is corrosive to our culture and our way of life. Why Lucifer even gets the blame for our overindulgence in everything from cigarettes to cheesecake. The devil made me do it. That's what we say. No, I don't think God gave God's self to save us from the devil. But I do think we use the notion of Satan to hide from the truth. You see, I'm growing more and more convinced that what God is really saving us from is not God's self. God's love is too great to be held captive by some self-contradiction present in God's very existence. I'm also more and more convinced that God isn't saving us from the devil or Satan or whatever name you'd like to call it because I'm convinced that such a being isn't on that sort of level with God in the first place. No, I'm growing more convinced with each day that God isn't saving us from God's self or the devil, but that God, God is saving us from ourselves. And that is without question what we need saving from the most. I believe this because of the words of Jesus. Words like those we've heard this morning. They're familiar ones to be sure. For God so loved the world 
that He gave His only Son so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish, but have eternal life. And while John 3.16 is among the most recognizable verses in all of Scripture, and rightly so, for it encapsulates so much of the heart of the Christian Gospel, reading verse 16 apart from the verses that follow can leave one without a full orb of Gospel. It creates a neatly packaged proof text without much explanation. And it can lead to an image of a God who gave Himself to save us from Himself. So listen again to verse 16, but this time with the verses that follow. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Those who believe in Him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. That the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Did you catch verse 17 and all of that? God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. That's important to understand. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn it, to convict it, to sentence it to death. No. Jesus didn't come down to wag His finger at us, to throw us behind bars, to sentence us. No. Jesus came in order that the world might be saved through Him. There's that word, saved. Now, I've already said I believe Jesus came to save us from ourselves, not God or the devil. And I say that because of what comes in verse 18. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already. Because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now, it might be easy to think that this verse is just another affirmation of the whole God saves us from God's self sort of idea. But that is only if we don't pay close attention, careful attention to that phrase in the middle of the verse. But those who do not believe are condemned already. Already. As in, if if before Jesus arrived as God's incarnate intervention in human history, we were condemned already? Condemned already, which seems to suggest to me that that's not an action of God, but our default position. That our default position is one of condemnation. That we are already condemned. And that is why God sent Jesus. Not to condemn the world because we've already done a good job of condemning ourselves. But to save it from us. Because Lord knows we can't save ourselves. But then again, if I'm being honest, I never really understood why we can't save ourselves. I mean, really, if salvation, if salvation is all about following rules to get into heaven, then it seems like we ought to have some power to do that, right? I mean, if we really, if our desire for heaven was so strong, we ought to be able to follow some rules, right? If salvation is all about my desire to spend eternity in quiet comfort rather than in infinite torture, then it seems like I ought to be able to follow a few rules to get in. And even if I don't follow the rules, even if I fail... Well, there's an entire system of sacrifice and penance I could do. So how come, how come I can't save myself? Why wasn't that enough? I suppose it has something to do with the impossibly long and often ludicrous list of rules outlined in Scripture. Have you read some of them? I mean, we're selling Boston butts. That's a sin. Half or whole, it's a sin. Have you read it? Or maybe, maybe it has something to do with the inefficiency of a system of penance that allows for sins to be offset by the blood of bulls and goats. Really? I steal your car and all I got to do is kill a goat? Spill its blood? Or maybe, maybe it's inefficient because there's something more to it. Something so obvious that we, we don't really want to admit it. Something found, I think, in the words of verse 19. This is the judgment. 
that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. People love darkness rather than light. Why do people love the dark? Why do we love the darkness? Now, I know right now many of you are saying, I'm not, I'm not one of those emo, uh, 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 you know, one of those folks that just wants to go out there and love the darkness. I'm not one of those people. I love the light. I love joy and happiness. I don't love the darkness. But understand what these words are saying. People can't help but love the darkness. We can't help but love the darkness. Why? Because the ultimate source of darkness The ultimate source of evil and wickedness in this world, the ultimate source of sin, is not the devil. It's not false religions. It's not even God, God's self. No, the ultimate source of darkness in this world is selfishness. And we are all infected by it. It's selfishness that renders obedience to the law null and the sacrificial system void. For if the only reason to follow the rules and make sacrifices is to ensure that I can get in while others are left out, that's a desire rooted firmly in selfishness. It is selfishness that causes hunger, pain, and suffering in this world. For at the root of every war waged, of every bomb dropped, of every stomach empty, of every broken spirit is the selfish desire of someone else, driven by the lie that there isn't enough or that someone's difference makes them less human, or that my wants are more important than your needs. God doesn't have to condemn us because we do a fine job condemning ourselves and our desire for the darkness and our craving for the selfish ambitions that lead us to believe in the deepest parts of our very souls that we are better than someone. When the truth of the gospel that we aren't better than anyone else. God doesn't have to save us from the devil, for we are our own devils, pursuing our selfish desires for safety and security and calling it religion. We're our own devils as we pursue the darkness of self-interest that can only drive us away from others and ultimately from God. God doesn't have to save us from God's self and some wrath-filled judgment, for we bring the wrath upon ourselves because we long for it. Because the true wrath of God, the very reality of God's wrath, is not a bottomless pit of hellfire and torture, but the infinitely increasing isolation of an eternity spent consumed by self. That's why we can't do it on our own. Because we'll never truly want to. There'll always be something within us, something in it looking out for me, for me. Instead, we'll be given to the idea that salvation is all about securing a better address on the other side of death, that faith is all about living to prove we're better than someone else, that this life is just the waiting room to a party in heaven where we are the guests of honor. We can't save ourselves from ourselves. We carry our own condemnation as we constantly seek what is best for ourselves, especially when it's at the expense of someone else, and it almost always is. We can't save ourselves from ourselves, and that's why we need Jesus to save us from ourselves, from our fears of being less than someone else, from our desires to prove ourselves that we are better than someone else from our self-made idols of religion that look an awful lot like us. We need Jesus to save us from ourselves. Because we're bound to run this world off course if we're left alone. Because we're bound to destroy each other in our own personal pursuits of prosperity. Because we are bound to eliminate each other with our competing ideals. We need Jesus to save us from ourselves. To show us that the only remedy to our selfishness is the selfless love of a God who leaves all that we could ever want. All that our selfish pursuits would ever lead us to. God left it all. Power, eternity, glory, honor, even heaven itself 
in order to walk on the hard ground of this earth, to suffer and die, to prove the eternal depth of God's love for us. God doesn't save us from God. God doesn't save us from the devil. God sent his son to save us from ourselves. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish in their own selfishness but have everlasting life in the selfless eternal love of God. Will you let God save you from yourself today? Let's pray. Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, as we have come into this place this morning, We have come, Lord, knowing that you have met us here. And God, knowing full well that we can't save ourselves. So Lord, save us. Come into our lives. Make yourself real to us. Show us the limits of our own selfishness. Save us. For Lord, we've done a good job of condemning ourselves. And we need you to save us. Move in our presence, Holy Spirit. Call us to that salvation even now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.